Let's welcome everyone who's new in the house and online, especially our military families. Say what's up to them. Make them feel at home. If you're online or if you're new around here, make sure you subscribe wherever you're listening to, podcasts, YouTube, whatever. And if we haven't connected, let's connect right now. Right on. We want to keep you in the loop. Let's connect on Instagram. You can find us at Ascent Church VA. If you'd like to also connect with me, we'd love to hang out at pastor.tlane. Let's keep the conversation going all week long. We love you. So thankful for you guys. And if you're online, if you're local, come hang out with us. Be here in the community. We're starting a brand new series today. It's called, whoa. Can somebody say, whoa. whoa. Say it like you're a little like, oh, what's heavy. Say, whoa. whoa. Right on. We're going to do some challenging stuff this next month or so, four or five weeks. Things that make you say, whoa. I've never heard a sermon series on this in my entire life, and that gets me fired up. All right, I love coming to a passage, and I'm like, I've never heard this preached before. I want to do it. All right, this gets me fired up, but it's challenging, and some of Jesus' words might make you stop and say, whoa. This is all of Matthew 23. We're going to study this this next five or so weeks. Let's start at verse 1, Matthew 23, 1. Then Jesus said to the crowds, And to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. Here it is. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Somebody say, whoa. All right, Jesus has no hesitation just coming at someone. In this day and age, we are probably the least confrontational society ever. Right? You want to have a hard conversation? You text it. Right? You mad at somebody? You write, a, you write a Google review. Okay? Jesus didn't have that luxury. Okay? Now he's coming right at him. This is an aggressive thing. But you keep in mind, it's aggressive. It's a lot. But Jesus is doing this out of love. And his words for them, I think, can apply to us. Because he's talking about hypocrisy among religious people. Some of you grew up in church, and the second you hit 18, you quit going to church because you met a hypocritical religious person. It might have been Aunt Edna. It might have been someone at church. It might have been, it might have been someone you didn't even know, but they came at you, or they critiqued you, or they judged you. Has anyone ever been hurt, annoyed, bothered, frustrated by a religious person? Anybody? in the house. That's most of us. Now the challenge with this is the danger is there are thousands of people here who call Ascent Church their church. And if we assume that out of thousands of people, we're never going to be offended, annoyed, or, you know, rubbed the wrong way by one of them, that's a challenging thing. That's a hard thing. That's a hard thing. The challenge is that the world is watching, right? And a lot of you, you share sermons with people, you invite families and friends to church. That's awesome. I love that. I'm glad you do it. But the world is watching. And if you post a sermon, if you share with a friend, they might not say this, but they're watching you. They're watching how you talk to others, how you love others, how you treat them. And maybe that may be the indication of whether they come to church with you or not. That's heavy. That's heavy. The world is watching. I want to talk to the parents for a second. You need to understand, your kids are watching. I think the biggest indication of, as to whether your kids will go to church when they're adults or not is you right now. If you've got little kids, how you talk about church, how you treat church. They're watching you, and more is caught than taught. They're absorbing this from you. And no parent is perfect, but your kids, they're watching. They're watching. Another day, my seven-year-old, this is like a Saturday, and it's like 11 a.m., and we had done nothing that day. We had played basketball. We'd done some art. We just goofed around, did some Legos. There was nothing hard. It was a chill day. I heard him. I heard him. I'm in the kitchen. I hear him come downstairs, and he sighs. (sighs) And he announces to the household, I've had a long day, I'm tired, and I need a snack. And at first I said, who does he think he is? And then I thought for a second, I said, I thought, he got that from me. I said, that's probably, what, that's probably what he sees me coming home from work. I've had a long day, I'm tired, and somebody get me a snack. I'm hungry. And it was funny, but it kind of caught me off guard a little bit. And I realized our kids are watching. The world is watching. Our kids are watching. I am shocked. And I'm not coming at you. I'm just trying to change your perspective. I'm shocked at how many people come to church, and you are very uncomfortable. People tell me this all the time. They come, and they're new, and they're sitting around. And you have this idea that everyone's around you is perfect. 
I get this all the time. You're sitting in the middle and there's hundreds of people around you and you think they have a perfect marriage. They have all their stuff together. They don't have any doubts. They have a lot of money. They don't have any debt. They don't have any problems. They have kids that aren't actually crazy and I'm the only one with problems. Would you do me a favor? Would you look around this room for a second? Everyone you just saw is a sinner. (laughs) Everyone's got problems. Everyone's got issues. And it's fascinating to me that people are hesitant to come because they think it's just them with struggles. I love you enough to tell you, you ain't alone. You're not special. It's all of us. It's all of us. You know the crazy thing? There's sinners at this church. You know what crazy thing? There are sinners who serve at this church. Did you know there's even a sinner on the stage right now? I can't believe it. But the way some of us talk And the way some of us act is we expect, we go to a church, we expect everything's perfect. Everyone is perfect. And some of you will come here for a week or two, maybe a month, then you'll join a team, then you'll join a small group. And I'm amazed at how many folks will come and they'll be here for a bit and they're hanging out and they'll join a group. And then within a month or two, they leave. They say, they leave. And they write a bad review on Google. They tell the world, someone was mean to me at group and I can't believe that happened. If you are looking for the perfect church, honey, you're going to be looking for a long time. Because sinners sin. I'm not saying sin's a good thing, it's a bad thing, but if you're looking for the perfect church with the perfect pastor, perfect leadership, perfect team, you're going to be looking a long time. We have this wrong view of church. Wrong view of it. A lot of you think it is a country club for the holy. It's a country club. I was at the Cavalier last night doing a wedding. It's, a, it's fancy. And that's what you think. You come and you think, it's a country club for the holy. The church is not a country club for the holy. It's a hospital for the sick. And if your marriage is in trouble, if your faith is in trouble, if you've got some addictions or a past or some doubts or some burdens, y'all, you came to the right place. You came to the right place. So lay that down. If you're this, if the devil's convinced you it's just me, it ain't just you. I love you. You're not that special. Now, some of us, right, we, we have this wrong view of it, okay? And you'll be here a little bit and you find there's a sinner here. You're like, I'm not going back to that church. That's like going to a hospital and finding out there's sick people there and being like, I ain't going back. I want to get well. I don't want to go to a hospital. There's sick people there. That's the best place for a sick person to be, dummy. That's like going to a new gym. You go to a new gym. You go to a new gym. And you say, there's overweight people at this gym. I don't want to be here. You go to a new gym. You say, there's people at this gym with skinny calves. I don't want to go here. Dog, if you're like me and you got some skinny calves, you best be at the gym because it's either that or you're going to be wearing pants 24-7, okay? Okay? It's the best place to be in a world that is obsessed with the destination. I want us to be pumped about progress, pumped about progress and not looking at someone's destination. Be like They're more ahead of me. But but are you growing closer to God today than you were yesterday? Is your prayer life better today than it was yesterday? Is your marriage better today than it was yesterday? If you get 1% better every single day, at the end of the year, you'll be 37 times better when that year is complete. 1% a day. And that's not even really noticeable. If your prayer life got 1% better, you wouldn't notice it. If, if your patience got 1% better, you wouldn't even notice it. But if you get 1% better, and the next day 1% better, and the next day 1% better, you're 37 times better when that year is up. Imagine if you were a better parent. Imagine if you were 37 times a better parent next year than this year. Imagine if the way you read the Bible was 37 times better. Imagine if the way you treated your spouse or the way you memorized Scripture was 37 times better. I want to be pumped about progress. Imagine if my calves are 37 times bigger. They'd be bowling balls, son. They'd be huge. And I would show them off too. But I believe I would. we got to get pumped about progress because we're all on a journey. And don't look down on someone if they're at a different stage in the journey than you are. We're all on this road together. Verse 4, we're going to continue. They tie up heavy, this is the Pharisees, they tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Here's what they would do. 
their heart maybe was in the right place. We don't really know. But what they tried to do, they read the Old Testament. And they said, we want to make this applicable for today. So if you want to follow the Bible, you got to do all this extra stuff. They added all this extra stuff. All this extra stuff. It's called extra biblical tradition. And the commentators tell us this, that the goal was to make the Old Testament relevant to new life situations, but, quote, its massive obligations had become burdensome and oppressive. They're basically saying, oh, if you really want to follow God, you got to do that, but all this extra stuff too. And we look at this and say, this is ridiculous. Who would ever do something like that? But I want to ask you, have we done the same thing today? Have you said, oh, you want to be a Christian? Oh, that's cool. you got to vote this way and this way only. You want to be a Christian? you got to listen to this music and this music only. Oh, you want to be a Christian? you got to dress this way, go to this concert, not this one. You can only do these certain things. Have we done the same thing? Now, where we're getting in the text over this next series, it's going to be called, it's called the seven woes to the Pharisees. Woe, W-O-E, like woe. The opposite of a blessing is a woe. You get it's a play on words because the series is called Woe. <laughs> and when you read them, you say, Woe. Okay, it kind of hits you. It knocks you flat really quick. And the way Jesus starts speaking in the Gospel of Matthew is that basically there's all these blessings and beatitudes. He's saying, Blessed are you who do this. He's showing us what a true disciple's like. And what some commentators think he's ending here, he's showing us what a false disciple is like. These are hard words. But in order to be sincere in an insincere world, in order to be authentic and, and real in this world, we got to study this together. That's what we're doing this series, The Seven Woes to the Pharisees. That sounds like a good name for like a punk band, doesn't it? Maybe a pre-workout, The Seven Woes of the Pharisees. If I made that pre-workout, would anyone drink it? Would you try it at least? That joke would be lethal. I'm going to mix it up. I'm just going to mix a bunch of energy drinks together, and we're going to chug them and see what happens to us. It's going to be a good time. Verse 5. This is the heart of it. I want you to see this. This is hard. This is heavy. But I love you enough to tell you hard things. This is heavy. Everything they do is done for people to see. One more time. Everything they do is done for people to see. Third time. Everything they do is done for people to see. Is there something that you do... And the only reason it's done is for people to see. Are you just in church so your spouse will leave you alone? Are you just listening to that music so someone will leave you alone? Do you just post about it? I was at church today, did quiet time today, went to the gym today, just so people can see it. That's the beef. That's the problem here. It says they make their phylacteries. Why? What's a phylactery? We'll find out soon. And the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor of banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. A phylactery was this in the Old Testament. There's several times when it talks about kind of wearing scripture. And some people have it like literally on their doorpost. And the phylactery was they would keep it on the right arm. It's a little leather thing with scripture in it. Have it on the right, left arm. Literally wear it on the forehead. Some of y'all think you're cool because you got a little cross on your ankle, okay? These jokers wear that junk on their forehead, okay? <laughs> this junk is real. And notice what Jesus said. It's not a problem that they did that. It's that they made them extra wide because they wanted everyone to see how holy and good and proper they were. Everything they do is done for people to see. What's the implication of this? It's this, guys. Guys, we obsess with the external, but God looks at the internal. In a world that is obsessed with the external, look at the internal. Y'all, I get a physical every year because I'm getting old. And my doctor ain't once asked me, how much do you bench press? Not once. I wish he did because I got that number. I wish he'd asked me something about the gym. He didn't ask me that. You know what he asked me? He says, how's your blood pressure? I don't want to know about that. I want him to ask me, how many times did you go to the gym this week? But he asked me, how's your cholesterol? Boo. I don't want to tell him how many times I had five guys this week. I don't want to tell him about my red meat consumption. I don't want to talk about that. What's he doing? What's he doing? What's he doing? Anybody, anybody ever been to the gym? And someone asks you how much you bench press? Anybody ever ask you what your blood pressure is at the gym? That's weird. <laughs> hey, dog, what's your cholesterol these days? What? 
Get away from me. I don't want to talk about that. We're obsessed with the external, but we ignore the internal. But the reality is the internal is a much better measure of our health, isn't it? My blood pressure, my cholesterol is a much better indication of my overall health than how much I can bench. Because I know some people who have been in some great shape and had a lot of stuff going on in here that wasn't right. A lot of stuff. Some of you after church today, you're going to go to Trader Joe's because it's fantastic. And you're going to be there and you're going to see a family drive by. Maybe they go to a sent church and they're going to have a great car. They're going to look good. Their kids are actually going to look showered. Right? They look like they got it together. They got a cool hat on maybe. And you're going to look at them and you're going to think they got it made. Their life is perfect. Right? We're looking at externals. You don't know how much debt they're in. You don't know what their bank account is. You don't know what their marriage is like. You don't know what their soul is like. But we look at the externals. We look at an Instagram, and everything looks so good, and the lighting's good, and the shading's good, and we're like, they are perfect. They got it together. But that's not an indication of how your soul is. I think the reason we're shocked when we see someone commit suicide is because things look great externally. You look at him, you say, you got a great wife, kids, car, career. You've done all this stuff. Like, you, you got it all on paper. Like, things look great. But I wonder what they would say if you asked them, how is your soul? Do you have anyone who is close enough to you to ask you, how's your soul? Not how's work. Not how's that client, not, not how's, this, how's this real estate season, not oh, how's your sports team, how's your soul? If you don't have people in your life who will honest to God ask you, how is your soul, that you can answer honestly, you're on a dangerous, dangerous path. I think it's one of the reasons mental health is so bad. And I hear the same thing. Someone else committed suicide. I'm shocked. Why? Everything was good for them. Their life was perfect. They had it all. Did they, though? Externally, maybe they did. What, what was going on in here? What was going on in their heart? Because God looks at the heart. God looks at the heart. This is scary to me. Matthew 15, 18 through 19, Jesus said this. He says, but the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart. Somebody say the heart. And these defile them. For out of the heart. It's the source of everything. It comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. Your problems come from the heart. It comes from the internal. It comes from what people cannot see. Which is dangerous. It's scary. Because a lot of us have become very, very good at hiding it. Very good at hiding it. When God was looking for a king for the people, he went to King David's family. All the big, strong brothers came out. But God said, no, no, I don't want that. He looked at David. He was an outcast. He was a runt. He was tiny. But God does not look at the externals. He looks at the heart. God cares enough about you to look at your heart. You care enough about yourself to look at your own heart, to look within, to see what's going on. The other day, I was listening to Taylor Swift. Don't act like you don't like her. <laughs> the ladies are saying no. The men are saying yes. We played Taylor Swift in the lobby, and we had to take away the lyrics because they were inappropriate. And I didn't have a single lady say, is this Taylor Swift? The dudes were like, is this Taylor Swift? I had the men recognize it. The dudes. All right. Now, I was listening to her not because I like her. This is sermon prep. This is research. And I take my kid to school, I drop him off, I'm going to the gym, and it's like six minutes. I'm literally drinking pre-workout, I'm going to the gym, and I'm like, I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, no, wait, no one's around, are they? I lock the doors of my Honda Accord, roll the windows up, and I put on Taylor Swift on my phone. And I'm driving, I'm on the interstate, I'm not joking. And I hear a honk, and someone passed me, and they're like, Pastor T, hi! And my first thought is, oh my gosh, they're here! They know! And I'm like, they can't hear, okay, I'm good. Okay, I'm good. I'm good. Everything's cool. Everything's cool. It's fascinating when we look at a secular voice, because Taylor Swift has it all, right? She's an amazing artist. She's amazing. It's fascinating when, when we see a secular voice 
um, kind of go against culture a little bit. Because culture is very much self-expression. If you got it, express it. Whatever you, whatever's in there, let it out. Right? Take it all. The world is here. We're here for a little bit of time. Just take it. Soak it up. It's interesting when we hear lyrics like this that I heard on my commute. Now, it's really hard for me to read these, not like in the beat. I'm going to try to just read them straight up. But it's not easy. I want to, no, I'm not singing it. Stop it. You stop it. She said this. Stop. I can do this junk. It's the last one of the day. I can do it. No. She said this. She said, I should not be left to my own devices. They come with prices and devices. I end up in crisis. Tale as old as time. Now, I think a lot of people sing that. And they hear that and they're like, that's a cool song. But when you stop, she's talking about her I should not be left to my own devices. Ends up in crisis when I'm, when I'm left to my, when, what's inside me leads to problems? That doesn't sound right. And then she said this, it's me. Y'all want me to do it? You guys. This is what Taylor said. She said, it's me. Hi. I'm the problem, it's me. You good? I'm done. That's not doing it again. I'm not doing it again. You're the worst. You're the worst people. You're the worst. She said, it's me. Hi. Last time, I'm the problem. It's me. At tea time, I did it. Everybody agrees. Look at this. Listen to this. She says, I'll stare directly at the sun, but never in the mirror. Now, I'm going to come at most churches. This is better theology than most churches. She's saying, I'll stare at the sun, but not in the mirror. I love this chunk. Because what happens if you stare at the sun? You ever stare at the sun? It doesn't go well. We love to stare at things that harm us, but we don't like to look at the mirror, to be introspective, to look within, because that might actually heal us. I'm like, dang, Taylor. Come on, girl. Okay. We have no problem staring at the sun. We have no problem staring at things that destroy us. We have no problem staring at pornography. We have no problem staring at others, comparing ourselves to them. We have no problem staring at our past and feeling guilty, shame. We'll stare stare at all these things. But to stare in the mirror might actually get us somewhere. It might actually get us somewhere when we look within. Now, I'm going to introduce a word that nobody wants to hear, but everyone needs to hear. And it's this word called repent. Repent means turn back. Repent means look in the mirror before you look out the window. Because Taylor is right. I'm the problem. It's me. What's wrong with the world? I am. I am. I'm selfish. I put myself first. I don't think of others. I don't think of God first. I think of me first. Right? But, but our tendency is to look around and say, you're the problem. It's you. If I were to say what's wrong with the world, most people say, you're the problem, it's you. Watch the news. What do they say? You're the problem, it's you. It's that country. It's that political group. It's that economic policy. You're the problem, it's you. Repentance is looking in the mirror before you look out the window and point the finger. It's turning back. And we might use the word repent when you've done something really bad. And it's like you look, and you're like, I'm sorry, God. But like repentance is supposed to be part of life, man. Am I loving the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind? Am I trusting Him? Have I, have I loved my spouse well today? Have I loved others well today? I'm the problem. It's me. I'm not saying the world's perfect, but you got to start there. Now, no one ever in the history of the church has quoted Taylor Swift and then quoted Martin Luther, but I'm about to. So hold on. Martin Luther... Some of you haven't heard of him. He's almost as famous as Taylor Swift. Martin Luther, father of the Reformation, said this. He, he had this thing called the 95 Theses. Ever anyone heard of this in church class, maybe Sunday school like 30 years ago? A few of you guys, maybe history class. Um, he, was a, he was a monk. He was a teacher, actually. He was a Catholic, and, and there were some problems with the church. And what he did, he wrote, he wrote this thing called 95 Theses. It was 95 ideas, problems, beef he had with the church, things that the church needed to work on. And he wrote 95 of them, and he took them to the door. It's a big deal back then. He hammered them to the door. That's what he did. And you've probably never read them, 
But this kind of started the Reformation. It's a huge deal in church history. Number one, I see as the gatekeeper and kind of the, the trendsetter of all of them. Number one is this. Martin Luther wrote, When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, Repent, in Matthew 4, 17, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. Not just like, well, I did something really bad. But to look in the mirror. To look in the mirror. We're afraid to do it. We don't like to do it. But to look within. And to figure this stuff out. Jordan Peterson, I'm going to keep going. Another secular voice said this. He says, I don't think that you have any insight whatsoever into your capacity for good until you have some well-developed insight into your capacity for evil. I mean, if you want to grow, if you want to learn about yourself, I completely agree with him. You've got to understand, I'm capable of some things. I heard Tim Keller share this story, and I've actually heard it from other sources too, but I just want to share it. Um, I heard this report that less and less high school kids know about the Holocaust, which is actually horrifying to me because it wasn't that long ago. And it's crazy that history, we forget history so fast. But there was one of the kind of architects of the Holocaust. His name was Eichmann, okay? Killed millions of people in concentration camps. And he was, under, he was, in, in, uh, he was in a trial. There's a, there's a trial. They're trying to you know, convict him for war crimes and all this. And they brought in this guy who was a survivor of a concentration camp. I think you say his name, Denier. Denier. I think it's how you say it. Denier is a survivor of a concentration camp, and he's going to come testify against the monster Eichmann, the Nazi. And you feel the tension, right? We've seen this in movies. We've seen this in shows. Like facing your accuser, and I can't imagine facing someone who had hurt me or had killed people I knew and loved and done all this destruction. I can't imagine looking someone in the eye. And everyone felt the tension in the room. And the Holocaust survivor, Denier, comes into the room, he comes into the courtroom, and he looks Eichmann right in the eye. And he collapses, and he sobs uncontrollably. And chaos breaks out. Chaos. The judge bangs his gavel. Order in the court. You've seen this scene. It's chaos. It's chaos. 20 years later, after that event, 20 years later, Denier, the Holocaust survivor, is getting interviewed. I don't know why it's so long. Maybe he's finally ready to talk about it. And the interviewer says, what was going on in your mind when you saw him? Why did you collapse? Was it rage? Was it fury? Did you just want to kill him? Was it sadness for all the crimes he committed? Was it, was it, was it a tear for, for all the innocent lives destroyed? What were you feeling in that moment? Why did you collapse? What was the thought? What made you just drop? And to paraphrase his answer, he said, when I looked him in the eye, it was not what I expected. He was not a superman. He was not a demon. He was just like me. And Denure, to summarize a blogger, wrote this. This is what he felt. He realized that he was capable of doing the exact same things. We look at others and we say, oh, Nazis, they're, they're monsters. They're terrible monsters. I'm good, they're evil. But this guy, looked, this, this survivor looked at this, this concentration camp guy and he said, he's, he's a human like me. There's something in my heart deep down that could do that, that could have that rage, that evil, and that scared him, it terrified him, it knocked him flat. There are things in your heart that if they ever bubbled up, would absolutely terrify you. They're right here. And if they ever came out due to circumstance or whatever, they would absolutely knock you flat. You would be shocked. You'd be appalled. They would absolutely knock you over. What you need to know is God has seen them. God knows them. He loves you to the bottom. And he wants to exalt you to the skies. There's some things in your heart you haven't even seen, but God has seen them. And he still sent his son to die in your place. And a lot of you in this room, you're thinking, you don't know what I've done. You haven't seen what I've seen. You don't know the regrets I have and the pain I carry and all this weight 
on me. And I've tried this, I've tried that, and nothing seems to change it. Friends, Christianity, the gospel, is less behavior modification and more heart surgery. It's not just trying harder. It's allowing God to work on you, to transform you from the inside out and to give you a new heart. The Old Testament says this, Ezekiel 36. Jeremiah said it too. He said, I will give you a new heart. This is God speaking, talking about Jesus. He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, a soft heart. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Do I want you to leave this place guilty? No. Do I want you to leave shame? No. Am I saying look in the mirror every day and make a list of all the bad things you've done and how you don't measure up? No. What I'm saying is this. For every one look you take at your sin, take seven looks at your Savior. Seven. Now, I don't know who first said that. I've heard that for years. An old theologian, I think. I don't know who first said it. But that's what repentance is. It's looking in the mirror and not just beating yourself to a pulp, but not it, the, the mistakes you make shouldn't cause us to look down. It should cause you to look up to Jesus on the cross, him bleeding and dying for you. And that grace, that forgiveness, that love, that's what transforms us. That's what works you from the inside out. That's what gives us a new heart, that grace, that love, that mercy. St. Augustine was one of the greatest minds in the church, still is brilliant man, probably one of the smartest ever to walk the earth, but when you think of St. Augustine, you probably think he was perfect. You might have seen a picture of him. He's got a little halo on him. St. Augustine was a sex addict. as plain as I can say it. Had a lot of things in his life. When he met Jesus, God got a hold of him. God started to give him a new heart, and and heard this story too. I've heard some, I've heard professors say it's true. I've heard this is just a story. I don't know, but follow me, follow me. St. Augustine, a lot of towns he used to visit. And he met Christ and he goes to this town. He used to go all the time. He had a girl there, if you know what I mean. He goes to the town. She doesn't know he's a Christian now. He goes, she says, Augustine, hi. She knows what this means. He's here to visit. She says, hey. He says, hi. Keeps on walking. She says, oh, I, I get it. He didn't recognize me. It's fair. It's been a little bit. She runs out in front of him. She says, Augustine, it's me. He says, hey, it's good to see you. I hope you're good. Very kind, very cordial, very polite. Keeps walking. Finally, she gets in front of him. She's like, he doesn't get it. She says, Augustine, it's me. And he smiles at her. He looks her right in the eye. And he says, but it is not me. What does he mean it is not me? It means he's a new creation. Was Augustine not tempted? No, I think he was tempted. Did Augustine want to be with I don't know that. Is this an overnight process? Sometimes does this take years? Sometimes the point is that God can give us a new heart, a new creation. The old is gone, the new is here. And I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've walked through. He can give you heart surgery. Have you ever had surgery? Do you know the best thing to do in surgery? Is to not fight the surgeon. Just lay there. Just shut up. Just hold still. When he's coming at you, don't knock his hand away. Don't argue every step. Don't turn. Try to run. Lay there. Surrender to him. And say, God, transform me from the inside out. Give me a new heart. Give me a new life in a way only you can. This can be yours today. Would you pray with me?